Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today I'd like to talk about biographies or really perhaps the way in which fiction and biography can merge. It seems to me that you almost can't turn a corner at the moment without being confronted by biographies, whether you're walking past your local cinema or flicking through the brochure of a theatre or turning on your TV or scrolling through your streaming service. You, on the one hand, might flick on Netflix and see The Crown. On the other, walk past your cinema and see adverts for My Friend Dharma. These biographies are about our kings and queens, our politicians and also some of our most prolific and depraved criminals. And I think it's all too easy to think that this is something that's peculiar to us, that because of our 24-hour news cycle and our desperate need to consume content, that people are essentially scraping every barrel they can to find stories to bring to us. But it's not peculiar to our time. In fact, if we look back a few hundred years, we can learn that this is absolutely nothing new. The obvious example is, of course, William Shakespeare's history plays, where the lives of kings and princes are played out on the early modern stage. However, the person I'd like to talk about today isn't a king or a queen or a prince. She's allegedly a criminal. And what I'd like to talk about today and attempt to do is to unpick the tangled web of fact and fiction that shape our understanding of a woman called Mary Frith. Let's go. So much of the truth or fact of Mary or Mole Frith's life remains elusive to us. Even her date of birth is lost. And this isn't uncommon. For many people in the past who weren't destined to sit on a throne or weren't born in a position that surrounded a throne, their birth date simply isn't recorded. We may, if we're lucky, have a baptismal record, but fire, flood, human error, all means that sometimes these records are lost or not properly made. So Mary isn't really an anomaly in this. What we do know is that it's claimed that she was in her 74th year at the time of her death in July 1659. We know that she asked to be buried in St Bride's, and she was on the 10th of August 1659. However, she allegedly wrote an autobiography known as The Life and Death of Mrs Mary Frith. And in this alleged autobiography, it gives a birth date of 1589 which would make her 70 at the time of her death and not 74. Now, we can of course question whether she is the real author of this autobiography and if she is, why she would have got her birth date wrong. Well, of course, it's possible that Mary is responsible for that error and exaggeration. It is to me, however, most likely that Mary or Mulfrith had absolutely nothing to do with the penning of this so-called autobiography. Published as it was three years after her death, I think it's an attempt for somebody, an anonymous author, to cash in on the scandalous life led by this woman. When I call her life scandalous, this is not my personal value judgment, of course. It is, I think, the judgment of many of her contemporaries. Because when Mole or Mary didn't find herself in the pages of ballads or pamphlets or plays, she did, unfortunately, find herself in front of the courts of justice. And here is a list of some of the crimes that we know she was accused of that made it to court. On the 26th of August 1600, Mary or Mole finds herself before the Middlesex Justices with two female accomplices, one Jane Hill and one Jane Stiles. The women were alleged to have stole a Clark and Well man's purse that contained two shillings and eleven pence. On the 8th of September 1609, she is accused of burgling a house in the parish of St Olave, Southwark, stealing over £10 worth of coins and jewellery. She is apparently found not guilty of this offence in March 1610. On Christmas Day 1611, she is arrested and sent to Bridewell Prison for being indecently dressed. Just what this means, we will be discussing in a moment. On the 27th of January 1612, 
Bishop King accused her of prostitution. She denies the charge, but he returns her to Bridewell. On the 12th of February 1612, so within a month of this charge of prostitution, it's reported that Mole does public penance at Paul's Cross. Presumably, she's doing penance for this charge of prostitution. It then seems that she is released. On the 23rd of March 1614, Mary is in the records again. This time, though, she's got married to Lucna Markham. Now, we're not sure how long this marriage lasts, but it seems that it was fairly short and, when it ended, fairly acrimonious. What's interesting to me is that Mary never uses her married name. She remains with her maiden name, which I think is thoroughly modern of her. However, this marriage clearly does bring her a degree of respectability, and it's a good few years before she finds herself back before the Middlesex justices. But she is back in 1617, by which time it seems that the happy couple is no longer happy and they are living separately. In 1621, she is called before Star Chamber. This is a court that sits at the Palace of Westminster and is comprised of privy councillors. And she is accused of being a fence, a receiver of stolen property. More specifically, it seems that when something would go missing, either from being pickpocketed or from being burgled, a person could approach Mary and, for a fee, she would get these goods back to them. She claimed that this is because of her contacts with the underworld, she was able to get goods back to their very receptive and happy owners. People said she was the one orchestrating these thefts in the first place and was then earning money by ransoming these goods back to their rightful owners. It's up to you to decide what you think is most likely. In 1624, she finds herself before the court of requests because of an unpaid bill for a shipment of beaver hats. In what seems to be her last recorded brush with the authorities or the law, we find Mary on the 21st of June, 1644, being discharged from Bethlehem Hospital, also known as Bedlam, having apparently recovered from alleged insanity. The indecent dress that gets Mary arrested and placed in Bridewell on Christmas Day 1611 is not perhaps what we would think of as being indecent dress today. Now, yes, she is accused on occasion of being a prostitute and also a pimp and a panda. And so it could be quite easy to see this indecent dress as being her wearing too little. On the contrary, I think that she is placed in Bridewell and perhaps the Bethlehem Hospital later because of her propensity to dress as a man. In doing so, she breaks with the established social order, much like her purchase that she doesn't pay for of beaver hats. She is breaking down the gender and class boundaries that are clearly codified at this time. Women cannot go about dressed as men. Men cannot go about dressed as women. A yeoman farmer can't dress as a prince. A fishwife can't dress as a duchess. Every strata of society is separated up by what they are permitted to wear. And the same goes across the separation of genders. What Mary is doing flexes and threatens to break this clearly codified social order. To deviate so profoundly from the established social order may begin as being seen as a criminal offence and may later, when it's repeated time and again, be seen as evidence of insanity. In the patchwork of fact and fiction, of the life of Mary or Molfrith, or to use her alternative name that you may know her better as, Mole Cutpurse, she comes down to us as a charming, roguish figure. She gads about London in her men's clothing, smoking a pipe and presumably swearing like a sailor. She's a thief and a pickpocket and maybe a pimp or a panda, absolutely, but there's something inherently likeable about her. And I don't think that's just a modern audience seeing that. I think the contemporaries that represented her on their pages and their stages also felt this peculiar affection for this criminal woman. She's a rogue, but she's a lovable rogue. As I mentioned earlier, Mary is the subject of her very own alleged autobiography that's published three years after her death, The Life and Death of Mrs Mary Frith. However, she was also in print during her lifetime and so would have been able to read and enjoy the representation of her. The first of these enters the Stations Register on the 7th of August, 1610. 
So this is just under a year after that alleged burglary that she's said to have committed in Southwark. And it is John Day's The Mad Pranks of Mary Mole of the Bankside. In Day's text, we see Mary going about the streets dressed in men's clothing. She is also accused by Day of playing the lute in the taverns and streets without a licence. Clearly, Day is attempting to cash in on the roguish charms of this lady criminal, and he certainly wouldn't be the last. Perhaps the most famous representation of Mary Frith appears in Thomas Middleton and Thomas Decker's The Roaring Girl. Published in 1611, the Mary Frith character of Mole Cutpurse in Decker and Middleton's play The Roaring Girl is a matchmaker of sorts. She comes across a young man who has fallen in love with an impoverished girl. His father will not allow him to marry a girl with such a poor dowry. So Mole hatches a plan. She will pretend to be this gentleman's lover. She will make his father think that rather than this impoverished girl with a small dowry, he is instead running off with a prostitute and a thief, Mole Cutpurse. Of course, they attempt to catch her out and catch him out, and all resolves with him eloping. His father thinks he's eloped with Mole Cutpurse and is, of course, relieved to find that instead his son has married Sweet Mary with her little dowry. Also tellingly within the play, the accusations about Mole as a Cutpurse and a pimp are shown to be false. They are the rumours of scandalised Londoners. They are attempting to take a woman who has essentially turned her back on the traditional feminine role of wife and mother, and they have made her into this criminal figure. It's essentially a different form of a witch hunt. She doesn't conform, and so she's accused of this. Through Middleton and Decker's play, interestingly, Mary Frith, through her counterpart Mole Cutpurse, is absolved of the accusations. Yes, she might stray from traditional female roles. She may dress as a man and she may mix with criminals, but it doesn't make her one. And essentially, all of the allegations against her are simply down to the fact that people cannot understand this woman who has deviated so profoundly. She isn't a criminal, she's a rebel. But she's a rebel with a heart of gold, who wants to see two young lovers happily placed together, to see a love match take place regardless of dowry. She is the hero of the piece. In April 1611, there is a report that Mary Frith appeared on the stage of the Fortune Theatre. She was dressed as a man, wearing a sword, and she had come to close out a play by dancing a jig. The assumption is that the play that she was closing was, of course, The Roaring Girl. Now, we don't know for sure, but I do like to think that this was the play that she was closing, because it means that she enjoyed this representation of herself, that she liked herself being fictionalised and mythologised in this way. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section down below. In choosing to title their play The Roaring Girl or Mole Cut Purse, Thomas Middleton and Thomas Decker are using a term that is most commonly at this time attached to young men. Roaring boys were carousing, street fighting, petty criminals. What this points to for me is that at this time, there simply isn't a phrase that fully explains or encompasses what Mary or Mole was. They have to borrow from the male world, just, I think, as Mary herself does in her costume and attire. She doesn't fit female definition, and so she borrows, seemingly, from men. It's important, I think, to briefly state that figures like the real Mary Frith and her fictional counterpart, Mole Cutpurse, also feature in other texts in the period. Slightly after the first production and printing of The Roaring Girl, in 1620, two polemical pamphlets appear. The first one, Hic Moulier, or The Mannish Woman, seems to be a direct response to James I's complaints against women going about dressed as men. The fact that the king is complaining about these mannish women would perhaps point to the fact that Mary Frith is not the only cross-dressed woman in London. Or perhaps she has simply become so famous that she has inspired others to dress and behave as she does. However, in that same year, a second pamphlet, a response, comes out. Hike Veer is the womanish man. 
And in this pamphlet, these mannish women are essentially absolved of their sin and the blame is placed firmly on the effeminate men that surround them. The women who dress and act as men, says this second pamphlet, are forced to do so because they have no appropriate male in London to support them. The men have turned woman, so the women must act as men. Let me know what you think of these pamphlets. If you find them interesting, perhaps I can make a dedicated video on them. Or if there's another pamphlet or libel or polemic that you'd like me to look at for a video, do let me know in the comments section down below. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you liked me talking about the facts and fictions of historical biography and you can think of another figure you'd like me to have a look at, please let me know in the comment section down below. I'm also going to leave my social media links in the description box. I'd love it if you come over there and follow me, but also you can come there and tell me if there's another topic or person you'd like me to cover. If you did like this video, please do click the like button so I know. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and that you're going to take care of yourself. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Bye-bye for now.